Good evening and welcome. It is time once again for CU Immigration here on WRFU LP Urbana 104.5 FM and UPTV. I will be your host for this evening. My name is Mr. Garza and I'm here to let you know that WRFU is an open forum for the Urbana Champaign community. Views expressed are those of the speakers and are not intended to represent WRFU or UCIMC or as we say on the televised version of this show, UPTV. These views are our own, and by our in this instance, if not in any other, I mean myself and or anyone whose opinion I happen to read during the course of this broadcast. So, there you have it. We're back again. Um, this is sort of a hodgepodge of stories today. I don't really have a central theme. There's a lot of economic talk going on here. But that's just par for the course because that seems to be the one angle that people can kind of dig into when they write about immigration. They can say, hey, whoa, I'm knocking things around here. They can say, hey, um, here are actual facts and figures. These numbers here tell me this story. Uh, the social stuff, the personal stuff, the human side is harder to get at. Uh, there are stories about that where you get uh, testimony of people that are affected by this or that law. Um, but those are, you know, they're often just overlooked by the people that just don't want to believe them. You know, they just say, oh, I don't care. It's not their fault. They shouldn't have come here in the first place if it, they didn't want X, Y, or Z. Um, so yeah, that's one reason why we find a lot of economic stories because those are harder to argue with. They still argue with them or they just ignore them altogether. But at least there you have numbers that you can put down on a piece of paper and say, look, here are the numbers that say this. So even though I like to get the human side of this story, um, you know, a lot of the time I'm stuck with the, <laughs> the financial aspect of it. But that's just the way the world works here. Uh, so anyway, the first story is entitled How the House Spending Bill Sets a Path to Legalization for Undocumented Immigrants. Of course, this still has to make it through the Senate and then come back and be matched up and finally uh, signed. But there is at least a start on this. So we'll see. So the reconciliation bill would create the largest mass legalization program for undocumented immigrants in U.S. history, but it falls well short of a path to U.S. citizenship. Roughly 7 million of the 11 million undocumented immigrants would be eligible to apply for work permits, permission to travel abroad, and benefits like state driver's licenses. A major step for immigrants from Mexico, Central America, and other lands who remain vulnerable to being deported. The bottom line, nearly 65% of the undocumented immigrants in the United States would be protected from deportation for up to a decade. The largest affected groups are from Mexico, followed by Central America, but the groups also include people from Asia, Africa, and all over the world. What critics say, well, we can guess what this... <laughs> we, we've heard this tune before, but we'll listen to it again. Republicans oppose the work permits or any form of legalization because of an influx of new migrants at the U.S.-Mexico border this year. They worry that granting millions work permits will entice more to follow and say that undocumented immigrants compete with Americans for low-wage jobs. Some immigrant advocates also oppose work permits and are demanding citizenship for longtime residents. Hmm. Senate prognosis. Here's the trouble point. The Senate parliamentarian has twice rejected a path to citizenship, saying it is a weighty policy that does not belong in a tax and spend bill. Democrats argue that immigration is a clear economic imperative, pointing to nationwide labor shortages and the country's reliance on immigrant workers during the pandemic. If the Senate parliamentarian also rejects the House plan, then Senate will have to decide whether to craft another proposal or disregard her advice and pass it anyway. President Biden favors the path to citizenship for undocumented immigrants, and in January he sent a bill to Congress that would have granted virtually all of them a path to U.S. citizenship. Talks with Republicans collapsed as attempted border crossing surged past 1.7 million in the fiscal year that ran from October 1st to September 30th. So Democrats have turned to their next best option, reconciliation. 
Congress has not passed a citizenship bill since the 1986 Immigration Reform and Control Act, signed by Republican President Ronald Reagan, put nearly 3 million immigrants on a path to U.S. citizenship. The law was also supposed to end illegal immigration forever. Senate Majority Leader Charles Schumer wrote in his memoir, but the numbers soared instead. Separately, the measure would also restore more than 400,000 green cards that went unused because of bureaucratic or pandemic-related delays. Green cards are for permanent residents who are on a path to citizenship and are typically sponsored by immediate relatives or employers. Others win green cards through the annual diversity visa lottery work permit program. The House provision would grant at least 7 million undocumented immigrants parole, formally admitting them into the United States if they file an application, pay a fee, and pass background checks. Then they would be eligible to apply for permits, authorization to travel outside of the United States, and driver's licenses. Sorry, I have a dog right next door who's right outside my window and who thinks that everything... Sorry getting this in front of my face. He thinks that everything is a good reason to bark, and so he's barking. Um, and it's annoying. I would like to work around it, but, uh, you know, he's there day and night. So pardon me, pardon him, her, whatever, and we will try to continue on. So to get these green cards, this parole, to qualify, immigrants must have arrived before January 1st, 2011, and lived here ever since. Work permits would be valid for five years and could be renewed on one time, extending protections through September 2031. Though far from a path to citizenship, the measure would transform immigrants' lives in the United States by allowing them to seek permission to travel to their native countries for the first time in years, if not decades, and to secure official government-issued identification such as state driver's licenses, which the majority of states do not offer to undocumented immigrants, including Texas, home to more than 1.6 million undocumented immigrants. Excuse me, the second largest number in the United States. What are the issues at stake? Well, most undocumented immigrants have little to fear under the Biden administration, which is only targeting threats to public safety and recent border crossers for deportation. But Democrats say it is critical to include immigration protections now because a future president could change Biden's rules. Democrats are also eager to codify the protections in law to thwart the types of legal challenges that have upended executive programs such as the Obama-era Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, or DACA. A federal judge in Texas has limited DACA, saying that the executive branch overstepped its authority and that Congress should have created the program instead. So there you go. Um, yeah, not much to say about that. Uh, we'll see what the Senate does with this. I don't have high hopes because there are, as we know, some grandstanding senators who just like to say no to everything that uh, they're like Republicans with the, with D badges on <laughs> basically. And, um, they seem to have a lot of the same prejudices and and just uh, wrong-headed thinking that a lot of the Republican senators have. So we'll see what happens. But hopefully, hopefully, something will come of it. So let's try Arizona. What do you think of Arizona? It, uh, generally speaking, um, it's kind of a place where you expect some pretty right-wing stuff to come from. But this is from the Arizona Capital Times. And it is entitled, Small Business Economy Needs Immigration Reform. Oh, really? Senators Kirsten Sinema and Mark Kelly should feel confident leading the nation to provide pathways to citizenship for undocumented immigrants in the Build Back Better agenda that is pending on Capitol Hill. As the founder of a statewide organization representing nearly 3,500 locally owned businesses, I know that legalization and citizenship will strengthen Arizona's economy, be good for small businesses and entrepreneurship, and help address our critical labor shortage. Arizona was once a battleground of anti-immigrant policies, but that time is thankfully behind us. 
Really? Today, legalization and citizenship for dreamers, temporary protected status holders, farm workers, and essential workers has shifted in the public opinion realm. In, recent, in a recent bipartisan poll sponsored by the American Business Immigration Coalition, only 10% of U.S. voters, including just 17% of conservative voters, believe that the priority for fixing our immigration system should be deportations. Here in Arizona, four out of five voters support pathways to citizenship for undocumented immigrants in the Build Back Better plan. Arizona's economy is fueled by small businesses, but we are facing a critical labor shortage that is the result of a perfect storm, including significantly changing career interests, COVID recovery, and years of anti-immigration policies. This has caused an extreme shortage of workers in the trades, hospitality, farms, and transportation, among other areas, all of which are essential for a strong Arizona economy. Our current our state currently has 181,000 open jobs that we simply don't have the workers to fill. Providing permanent status for undocumented workers is not a panacea for solving this problem, but it's an urgently needed piece of the puzzle. According to one analysis, legalization and citizenship will increase economic activity nationwide by $121 billion annually, including adding $31 billion per year to federal, state, and local tax revenues. About a dozen states will particularly benefit. Arizona's economy will increase by $3 billion per year. New businesses are the drivers of job growth, and we are fortunate that Arizona is home to more than 70,000 immigrant entrepreneurs. The household income of our state's undocumented immigrants is $5.1 billion per year. They pay $556.5 million in taxes and have a spending power of $4.5 billion annually. The bottom line is that Arizona is stronger when we are inclusive and welcoming to all people. Now, I know that uh, regular listeners to the show will go, well, yeah, <laughs> because that seems obvious. Um, and if you remember from the last uh, the article before this, where we were talking about the people, what they're saying against the idea of making uh, issuing these green cards, for example, is that it takes away jobs from low income citizen workers um but these jobs are out there right now and they're begging to be filled <laughs> and they're not being filled uh, so what does that tell you so here we have an example uh, you know here's a situation where uh these workers are you know immigrant workers are not legalized they're not supposed to be taking these jobs um and we're keeping a lot of people out and we have a lot of jobs that are just going begging and we have all sorts of businesses that are saying oh people just don't want to work anymore we're offering jobs and nobody wants to take them that's got to tell you something um there are a number of reasons for this as the previous writer mentioned and and one of it is that uh, people I think because of the pandemic, people have reappraised their situations in some uh, lines of work and just said, you know what, I don't want to do this kind of stuff anymore. Um, I was put in unsafe situations uh, during the beginning of the pandemic, for example, a lot of frontline workers felt like, you know what, I wasn't respected, I wasn't taken care of, I wasn't protected, I, I had friends or relatives or whatever that were dying around me, I'm not going to do this sort of thing anymore. This is not for me. So we have people who've just quit those kinds of jobs and don't want them anymore. Um, and let's not forget, we have lost tens, hundreds of thousands of people have died during the pandemic and or been uh, severely disabled. That takes a chunk out of the workforce, uh, one way or the other. Those, a lot of those were people that were working, you know, and they're not working anymore because they're gone. So there are a number of things that happened, have happened recently, that have made job more job openings, and uh, we need people to fill them. And everybody admits it, but for some reason, the people that are anti-immigrant just seem to think that 
complaining and trying to guilt people into taking uh, jobs they don't want is th the way to go. It's like, oh, no, we shouldn't bring in people from somewhere else. We should just make our citizens feel really guilty about not taking these jobs that they really don't want to take. Hey, if they don't want to take jobs, give it to somebody who will take it. I'm sure there are some immigrants who are willing to come here and take a lot of these jobs that people are saying no to right now. Um, give them a chance. Uh, it just, it makes sense. And if this weren't a big, uh, what would you call it? You know, a political purity test. You know, if you're for this particular political party, then you have to say these following negative things about immigration because that's just what is expected of you. You know, if it were just a matter of people using logic and and looking at the numbers, looking at the situation in front of them, we would have a very different story here. But it's just too convenient of a topic for people to make hay out of, if I can put it that way. And so it continues to be a huge problem. Anyway, I'm going to move on. There's not much to say about that. We all know what that issue is and that situation, and it's really annoying. So uh, how about this? This is entitled, Long Closed to Most Immigration, Japan Looks to Open Up Amid Labor Shortage. Well, Japan's having a labor shortage, too. Let's see what they're doing about it. So Japan has long stood out among industrialized nations for its closed door policy on immigration. But as the country faces an acute labor shortage on top of looming problems brought on by the population decline, Tokyo is moving to open up at least somewhat to foreigners. Japanese officials said Thursday that the government is looking to allow more foreign workers in blue collar positions to stay indefinitely and bring their families with them. The move would potentially open up opportunities to live in Japan long term that are currently available only to a small cadre of foreigners in sought after professions. The change would mark a substantial shift in the country in a country traditionally seen as unwilling to turn to immigration, even when experts urged it as a solution to labor shortages, population decline or in response to refugee crises. Under a program that began in 2019, semi-skilled workers in understaffed sectors, including manufacturing and janitorial work, had been allowed to work in Japan for up to five years, but were not allowed to bring their families. However, workers in two sectors, construction and shipbuilding, were subject to different rules that allow them to renew their visas repeatedly and bring their families to live with them. Amid a labor shortage worsened in part by the coronavirus pandemic, Nikkei Asia reported Thursday that the government was now planning to expand the looser rules to all 14 business sectors that are understaffed in Japan, potentially opening up extended residency to a far larger proportion, proportion of foreigners as soon as next year, according to the business-focused daily newspaper. At a news conference, Chief Cabinet Secretary Hirokazu Matsuno confirmed the news but emphasized that there was a difference between renewals of visas and permanent residency. Quote, I understand that the Immigration Services Agency and other relevant bodies are currently looking into the matter toward expanding the category of workers who can renew visas and bring their family, Matsuno said, according to Reuters. Though the moves are modest in a global perspective, they are significant in Japan. For decades, immigration was a political taboo, with concerns about culture and ethnic homogeneity often espoused by Japan's powerful right wing. The country accepted only modest numbers of immigrants, often making strict requirements of them. Only select groups, such as the families and descendants of Japanese immigrants who had made new lives in Latin America, were offered permanent residency. While persistent conventional wisdom held that the large-scale immigration would be a political non-starter, officials took quiet steps to bring in steadily increasing but rel still relatively small numbers of workers without sparking much public debate. This often occurred under tenuous circumstances, including rules allowing foreign students to work part-time in jobs that have sparked controversy over reports of poor conditions. 
Japan's closed-door policies have long stood in stark contrast to those of many of its peers. By 2016, the country had accepted only a handful of refugees from Syria's civil war, while European countries in the United States had received thousands. But in recent years, the aging of Japan's population has raised significant questions about the policy. In 2016, official figures showed that the country's population had declined by almost one million people in five years, marking the first time that records showed a drop in population. In late 2018, former Prime Minister Shinzo Abe's government pushed through a law that opened immigration to foreigners in 14 understaffed industries, based on an estimate that the fields in question were seeing a shortfall of some 345,000 workers. According to Nikkei Asia, about 35,000 workers were in the program as of August. Though Abe's Liberal Democratic Party, which is still in power, although Abe has left office, is conservative, it is also closely aligned with Japan's business community, which had warned about looming shortages. And polls have generally shown that Japanese citizens are open to allowing more immigration, often viewing it as inevitable, though a staunch anti-immigrant wing persists. The pandemic has only heightened the push, putting the Japanese economy under strain. The country's economy shrank at a 3% annual rate between July and September, according to official data released this week. Though some experts met the proposed policy shift with cautious praise, others warned that many foreigners in Japan have suffered under exploitative employment situations and poor living standards codified by previous immigration programs. Foreign workers in Japan have long complained of insufficient labor protections, long hours, low pay, and isolation. This week, after the death of a 33-year-old Sri Lankan woman at a detention facility in March, Japanese officials pledged to reform the country's immigration services agency. The woman, Wishma Sandamali, had been detained for overstaying her student visa. Her family has filed a criminal complaint against the director and deputy director of the facility, as well as the officers in charge on the day of her death. Such an incident must never happen again, Justice Minister Yoshihisa, Yoshihisa Furukawa said in an interview with Japanese outlets. Mm. Well, so here you have an example. I mean, there is a strong anti-immigrant sentiment in large portions of the Japanese population. But you have a conservative party that is closely aligned with business, which... Ah, gosh, I keep hitting this thing, which you used to have around here in this country, but the Conservative Party has, in recent years, more closely aligned itself with, uh, as a popular sort of nativist party rather than a, a, a business party, and they're actually going against big business in all sorts of ways, and that has caused problems for them. Um, and so they're not budging on immigration, whereas in Japan, even though there's still a strong anti-immigrant sentiment, the conservative party is at least getting the word from their business counterparts and saying, yeah, we need more people. And that same thing would have happened here in the past, but uh, the current, our current conservative party, as I said, is more populist and nativist. Um, and they're not, you know, not bending to what the business community is telling them. So we'll see what happens with that. I don't know. Okay, our next article is entitled, Families Still Find Slow Going in Immigration Courts, Not the Fast Docket Planned. Hmm. The average time for U.S. immigration cases to be resolved is nearly four years. But that's not the mandate in Francisco Prieto's courtroom. The New York judge must attempt to rule within 300 days on dozens of cases he hears daily from families that just entered the country. The migrants are being sent to the front of the line with the idea that others will be less likely to migrate, knowing a backlog of more than 1.4 million cases will no longer buy them a few years in the United States, even if they lose. Nearly six months ago, the Biden administration established a dedicated docket for families, many seeking asylum, in Prieto City and 10 others, including Boston, San Francisco, Miami, El Paso, 
Texas, Miami and El Paso, Texas. I don't understand why they had to say that El Paso is in Texas and all these others, they just assume you know where they are. But anyway, that's this writer. That's not me. Okay. It's a modest step aimed at bringing order to the southern border where authorities this year have faced unusually high numbers of migrant arrivals, including nearly 15,000 mostly Haitians who camped under a bridge in the small border town of Del Rio, Texas in September. Roughly 35 of the country's more than 530 immigration judges are assigned to the new docket, according to the most recent data provided by the Executive Office for Immigration Review, which oversees federal immigration courts. Many juggle the duties on top of their normal caseloads. While it's still early, the effort has made progress. As of mid-September, it was handling nearly 16,000 cases, and more than 100 had received at least an initial decision, according to the agency. It declined to provide more details. Still, the numbers barely make a dent. Tens of thousands of migrants are released into the country each month, with orders to report to immigration authorities later. The expedited docket also faces some of the same challenges and complaints as similar efforts under Biden's two predecessors. Critics say it rushes the complex work of building asylum cases, making it nearly impossible for migrants to have a fair shot, especially if they can't secure an attorney in time. Judges follow the same procedures applied in other immigration cases, but on a shorter timeline. During the Obama and Trump administrations, most families that went through similar fast-track docket lacked legal representation and were ultimately ordered removed from the country, according to the Migration Policy Institute, a D.C. think tank. Prieto, the New York judge, is among those handling the most cases under the new docket, with more than 1,600 assigned to him by the end of August, according to the Transactional Records Access Clearinghouse, or TRAC, at Syracuse University. One day last month, the Trump appointee urged families to find a low or no cost attorney on a government referral list. Some said no one answers the phone when they call or they are told they can't be helped. Prieto told them to persist before he set new court dates. Many families had immediate concerns, trouble with their ankle monitors or with rules confining them to their homes one day a week. Yasalyn Margarita Aguilar, who appeared with her young daughter, can't leave her house on Fridays. I found a job and I lost it because I was told I can't miss Fridays at work, the Honduran woman told the judge. I need more time to find an attorney because I don't have a job and I can't pay. An unusually large number of cases got postponed because the court didn't receive hearing notices from the Homeland Security Department. Prieto told families to wait for another notice. Creole interpreters were connected by phone for Haitian migrants. One family's hearing was delayed due to technical difficulties. Their child ran around the courtroom while they waited, crying loudly when his fingers got caught in a swinging door. Another woman from Ecuador who arrived with her husband and two children, one in a stroller, asked for a work permit. Prieto told her to discuss it with an attorney. More than half of cases are in New York and Boston, a common destination for Ecuadorians, Brazilians, and Haitians. 